We have a wonderful Purim evening planned for everybody tonight. Of course, our big Purim celebration is at Temple is going to be the Saturday night with our big spiel, but we didn't want the evening of Purim to go by unnoticed and un uncelebrated and unobserved. So um, we hope that you will enjoy tonight's Latka Hamantashen debate. We'll get talk more about that in a little bit. You'll hear a little bit of Megillah tonight as well, as well as on Saturday, and um, and a few other tricks up our sleeves. So um, we're so glad uh, we've got a uh, groovy Rabbi Levy with us um, as well. And uh, I told him he looked like a guy I dated in high school, dressed like that. Um, and, and uh, uh, take it away, Rabbi. Sure. Well, let's go ahead and start uh, with some songs. But first, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can all get this slideshow rolling. Because, of course, we have to have some visuals. I still see some people filtering in, so that is a good sign. All right, Chag Purim Sameach, Happy Purim, everyone. Welcome in. So we're going to start by singing song Chag Purim. And if you know it, please sing it along with us. If you don't know it, still sing it along. Um, just please make sure you remain muted as much as I would love to hear everyone, um, all of your voices coming through the, to, through the Zoom space might be a little bit difficult, a little bit challenging, but please join in. Chagburim, Chagburim, Chagadol Ayehudim, Masechot, Rashanim, Zmirot Ikudim. Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Baharashanim. Chagburim, Chagburim, Chagadol Ayehudim, Masechot, Rashanim, Zmirot Ikudim. Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Baharashanim. Chagburim, Chagburim, Chagadol Ayehudim, Nasechot, Rashanim, Zmirot Rikudim. Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, 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 Havana Risha, Rash, Rash, Rash. So we'll continue on. We'll get, we're going to hear a little bit of the Megillah tonight because, of course, we, we need to hear a at least a little bit of the story. Oh, there it goes. And um, so we have the distinct honor and pleasure of having our very own Nancy Cohen to oh, chant goodness. some of the, the poor Megillah for us. But before we do that, let's go ahead and say the blessings over and, and on the holiday of Purim, we're obligated to actually hear the Megillah. So we're going to hear, we're going to say a blessing over the reading of the Megillah and hearing the Megillah, as well as, of course, uh, Asheh uh for reaching this moment and this joyous season. So if you'll join me, Baruch Atah Adonai, Elohim Melech Asher Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who sanctified us with your commandments and have commanded us regarding the reading of the Megillah. Let us say together. Amen. Amen. And we have, uh, seeing as this is a joyous holiday, where we're celebrating sort of a miracle, the miracle, and even though uh, the entire Book of Esther doesn't necessarily mention God. We see God um, in the background working to save the Jewish people. So we say this blessing: Baruch Atah Adonai Haolam Shasani Simla Avotenu Vimotenu Bayamim Hashem Basman Hazeh Amen. 
Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who performed miracles for our ancestors in those days and at this time. And finally, since we have reached this joyous season yet again this year and have the opportunity to come together, we say together, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shechianu, Bekiyamanu, Vehigianu, Lazman Hazeh. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has given us given life, life sustained us, and allowed us, allowed us to arrive. arrive in this moment. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, who's going to take us back, way back to Shushan in the Persian Empire. I Asher <laughs> Et Oh, you want? Okay. We're going to move on to chap part, chapter two. Okay. Uh, Ach. Ish, Yehudi, Ayah, Bishushan Habira, Ushmo, Morechai, and <laughs> I am Bai <laughs> Na, <laughs> 
ערויות לתת לכם מבית המלך, וישנתה אביית נערותיה לטעות בית הנשים. לא הגיד אסתר את המאביית מולדתה, היא מרדכי, ציבה עליה אשר לא תגיד. אחר הדברים האלה ידחל המלך אחשוורוש את המן בן המדת האגגי וינסהו ויעשם את כסאו מעל כל השרים אשר איתו וכל עבדי המלך אשר בשער המלך קוראים ומשתחווים להמן. יכן סיבה לו המלך ומרדכי לא יכרע ולא ישתחווה היום רוחו עבדי המלך אשר בשער המלך להם מורכי, מדוע אתה עובר את מצוות המלך? ויהי ימם אליו יום ויום, ולא שמע עליהם, ויגידו להמן, לראות היעמדו דברי מורכי. ויהי גילהם אשר הוא יהודי, ויער המון, יין מורכי, קורא ומשתחווה לו, וימלא המון חמא, ויהי בן דיניו, יש לו הכלל ומורכי לבדו, ויהי גילהו את עם מורכי. ויבקש המן להשמיד את כל היהודים אשר בכל מלכות אחשוורוש עם מורכי Um, every, as you know, every, every Megillah, the five Megillot, each has a unique uh, sound and a unique trope. So thank you always for that. Well, this year we are engaging in a very famous tradition at this time of year. It's a Latka commentation debate, which is the best food. Now, this dates back more than 75 years to the University of Chicago, actually. And every year, it's a very big deal in the Jewish community there uh, to have a Latka Hamantaschen debate. And um, kind of grows out of uh, the sense of, um, you've heard of somebody getting up on the soapbox. Well, this whole studs turkel getting up on the so soapbox to speak was very much part of kind of the Chicago ethos. And it grew out of that. So tonight... Rabbi Levy and I will engage in our very own Latka Hamantaschen debate, and you all will get to be able to vote at the end of the evening, Latkas or Hamantaschen, and who did better. So without further ado, it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my opponent tonight, the groovy Rabbi Ross Levy. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's a, an honorific title for pitchers, but uh, thank you very much, Rabbi Eger. So I have a very solemn but important duty to perform this evening, and that is to defend and uphold the good name of latkes everywhere. So if you'll give me one moment, I do have some visual component to my presentation. All right, I want you all, I want to first, let's begin with 
a sensory experience. I want you all to close your eyes, take a deep breath in, feel your feet flat on the floor. Think about that feeling, it's cold outside, maybe there's some snow on the ground, depending on where you live, and it's winter time, and you're just looking for something warm, you're looking for comfort food. You walk into a house, whether, you know, maybe it's a friend from down the street, or it's your grandparents' house, and the first thing that hits is that beautiful smell of fried foods, onion, potato, coming from the kitchen, and you know what time it is. You know it's time for the famous latkes, to light the candles, to share some guilt. I understand this is not about comparing the two holidays, but we have to remember that latkes are not just a food, they are a feeling, they are an ambiance. They are anything you could have, they're a full culinary experience from texture to sound, to taste, to smell, anything you can imagine. Now, before we get into the merits of the latka itself, I would like to ground it in a little bit of history. So we are taught that the story of uh, the original latka was made by Judith, a Jewish woman living in the land of Israel in ancient times during the Greek occupation. Um, actually, uh, the figure you see her uh, very unceremoniously beheading is the Assyrian general Halophanes. And we are taught that in order to fight against the oppressive uh, Assyrian Greek regime, that she brought this general into her home, fed him some wine, fed him some cheese cakes, some fried cheese cakes. And eventually he was so satisfied and, ha and so content that he fell asleep, allowing her the opportunity to lop his lovely dome off. And we, we are told that latkes actually come from this tradition that in Eastern Europe, eventually there was a cheese shortage, shortage. There, was, there was some food shortage. And so cheese was not abundant, but potatoes were. And that was how the potato latka was born. But I think more than history, this, serve, this serves to represent the meaning of a latka. Eating latkes is fighting against oppression. Eating latkes is fighting against the patriarchy. It is the empowerment of our people. It is the empowerment of women who have suffered all too long. And as we, as any of us who might be, uh, have a little bit of experience eating latkes, you know that both in the making of them and sometimes in the eating of them, they are equally dangerous and delicious. I don't know about you, but a little bit of danger in my food, in my holiday, it just makes things a little bit exciting. So if we move to the latka itself, we're talking about one of the more versatile, timeless pieces of Jewish culture and of Hanukkah celebrations and of food in general. It can be sweet. It, you can have it with applesauce with cinnamon. It can be savory, as we see here, served with a little bit of smoked salmon, some chives, maybe some, some dill, some creme fraiche. You, it, you can make it with dairy. You can make it with a meat meal if you are, uh, if kosher is your typical persuasion for eating. You can do anything with a latka. And even be looking beyond the scope of what a latka can be within sort of the Jewish context, it can be pretty much anything you want it to be. It, you can have it with eggs, you, with toast in the morning. You could have it, uh, use it for, to make a sandwich during lunchtime. You can do pretty much anything that you want. You can make it with sweet potatoes. You can try with different types of potatoes. It is beautiful and it is perfect.
as we see here, latkes are in a certain sense a form of hash brown. You can have it with eggs, maybe sort of a huevos rancheros, but instead of tortilla chips, you have latkes. I could not think of anything more delicious. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about my opponent tonight, the hamantaschen, which I might point out that ingrained in its name is the name Haman, Haman, boo, yes, I can hear all of the groggers going. How can we eat and accept a food that in includes the name of the great enemy of our Purim story? Beyond that, look, we're often taught that the Hamantaschen represents Haman's hat, a triangular hat that Haman supposedly wore. But we also know that is some, they are sometimes referred to as Haman's ears, a triangle shape for Haman's ears. Uh, in Hebrew, they are referred to as Ozne Hamon, or Ozne Haman, the, the ears of Haman. Now let's, let's, let's play this logic out. Let's think about this for a second. We are theoretically making desserts shaped after the ears of someone who tried to commit genocide against our people with a variety of types of fruity or otherwise filling that I guess represents his earwax, his brains. Let's be serious here. Come on, what are we doing? And not to mention, not to mention the other etymology associated with Hamantaschen is that it's not even Haman's ears or anything like that, but Tosh meaning pocket, it, because it represents the inside of a pocket. I mean, what is going on here? Now, it wouldn't make sense that you're talking about some pockets because anyone who's eaten a hamantaschen knows that the second you eat it, they just crumble and they fall everywhere and it's a mess. And it's sort of similar like finding a bunch of crumbs in your pocket. But between all of this dry dough, these various fillings with prunes, poppy seeds, I mean, what are we doing here? Seriously, this is how we celebrate the, e the end of a, an attempted genocide. I think fried foods are much, much more clear of an option. Now, finally, I want to make a final point to you all. And for this, I need no visual. Let's just think of how many times we've all tried to make hamantaschen. You have your filling. You have your, your dough, it's all rolled out, it's ready to go. You're shaping your triangles, you pop them in the oven, and lo and behold, you take them out of the oven and they're not triangles anymore. They're just these circular disks, these, these cookies that have just amorphously come out of an oven. And most people look at that and say, that's not a hamantaschen. We, we, you can't eat that, that doesn't represent the holiday. But latkes, latkes need no particular shape. Latkes will take you as you are. They won't make you to conform to the strictures of society. Latkes will accept you for who you are and how you are. And that, my friends, is why latkes are the superior Jewish food. Thank you. Well, we'll see about that, Rabbi Levy, for an interesting presentation about latkes. But I believe you have something else for us. At this I do, stage. I do. So we are going to continue going through the story. So Nancy chanted for us bits and pieces from the from the uh, first three chapters of Megillata Stair from the. Uh, the scroll of Esther, uh, but Rabbi Agar thought, and I thought it would, and I thought it would be a good idea to also highlight the rest of the story. Um, not quite with the beautiful chanting that Nancy treated us to, um, but with a slightly different interpretation, or I guess leaving it up for interpretation. So first, we come to chapter four where we read of Mordechai dressing himself in sackcloth and ashes for fear of what might happen 
to the Jewish people. And we see that, uh, that a message is sent out to the rest of the Jews in the Persian Empire, asking them to do the same. But Esther steps in and says, and says, stop with all this sackcloth and ashes, with all this, um, this depressing ritual. We have a chance here. I think I can conven convince the, t the king to listen to me. And so then, as a final way of encouragement, uh, you have Esther explaining to Mordechai to ask all of the Jews throughout the provinces to fast um, for as a way of prayer, as a way of support. And that is actually where we get at the end of today, being the end of the fast of Esther, Tanit Esther. Um, we have that being described here in chapter four. So then we move to the fifth chapter. And here we have Esther presenting herself in the king's court. And throughout the book, we or throughout the story, we have descriptions of the king's golden scepter being sort of the, uh, the instrument of power within, within, uh, the, within the court. And the king asks Esther, what is it that, uh, that you would like? And um, Esther asks that a feast is prepared. A uh, feast specifically uh, including Haman as a way of sort of getting Haman in the same room uh, in, in the upcoming days as a way of figuring out a way to uh, guard against his plans to massacre the Jews throughout the empire. And, and as Haman would leave the, ga the gate, the, we famously read that Mordechai would be sitting at the gate and would not bow to Haman and as, a, as a sign of respect in the same way that everyone else did. And so this moment at the gate is really what stirred a lot of this anger and a lot of this hatred within Haman. And so as we're moving in towards that feast in chapter six, there we go, we have a very familiar uh, image to any of us who stayed up late uh, or couldn't sleep and decided to bury our face in a book. Uh, but we read about uh, King Ahasuerus not being able to sleep and and going to check the records, the royal records of in his palace and discovering the amazing things that Mordecai had done for him, rooting out some conspirators who had sought to rebel against him. And so he organizes a procession, a royal procession to honor Mordechai. And Haman is the one that is, yes, Haman, blah, 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 is the one that is supposed to lead it. And so Haman brings Mordechai around in this royal procession. Obviously, this is not uh, accurate garb for the, uh, for the Asian Persian court, but you get the idea. And this only deepens the hatred and the ire that Haman feels towards Mordechai. And uh, once that is done, Haman is brought back into the banquet that Esther had prepared, and we will see what happens next. Well, thank you for that, Rabbi Levy. We're going to, uh, we're going to, I'm going to share my screen because now we're going to learn why Rabbi Levy was completely wrong and why it is really the food of this holiday that actually indeed is the best uh, that you will ever enjoy. Um, here we go. Well, this is the great Latka Hamantashen debate for Kola Me this year. And I'm going to try and get my computer to work. That would help a lot. First of all, let's be really clear. The most important reason to, that hamantaschen are the best is because they're actually delicious. Let's be honest. Greasy, 
potatoes that after a little bit of time, they might start out crisp, but then they aren't crisp. You can't reheat them in the microwave. They taste terrible after that. And you know, hamantaschen, well, they just last and last. They come in so many flavors. And of course, hamantaschen can be sweet with many different fillings. You have apricot, you have lekvar, prune, you have mun, which is the poppy seed, of course, hamantaschen, that's part of how it got its name, because poppy seed cakes were very common in the German and Polish uh, areas, and so they heard that the name Mun sounded like Haman, and so this is how, in part, Homentaschen became the food for this holiday. You can fill them with cherries, you can fill them with strawberries, you can fill them with chocolate chips, you can fill them with so many things. I even know people that put Nutella in their Homentaschen. As many things as you want, you can put inside your hamantaschen these beautiful three-cornered cookie a perfect triangle delicious every time here again many of the different flavors that you can put inside and then we didn't even mention that in the dough itself if you're using a cookie dough traditionally a shortbread dough on the one hand you can make the dough actually taste like many different things. You can put in orange rind or lemon rind. You can have chocolate dough uh, to make your hamantaschen. It is infinite in its amazing, amazing, amazing opportunities. But if that wasn't enough, hamantaschen just sweet. They can also be substantial and be a main meal. They can be savory. So you can have pizza hamantaschen with mozzarella and cheese. You can have it with mushrooms. You can have it with other kinds of grilled vegetables. You can have hamantaschen sweet or savory. An incredibly versatile, versatile cookie, a versatile, versatile dough. But if that wasn't enough, it's you can also be doesn't have to be cookie dough. It's become popular in the last many years in North America to use cookie dough. You gener generally a shortbread type of dough, but when I was growing up, it was much more common to have yeast, a risen yeast hamantaschen, and these are still delectable and delicious. Again, they can be savory or sweet. They can even be iced, as you see in this picture, with a drizzle of glaze upon them as well. You can decorate hamantaschen. You can't really decorate a latka. Let's be really honest. You know, a plop of applesauce, a plop of sour cream, maybe, if it's, you know, not eating it with brisket, because, of course, you know, that's mixing fleshek and milchen. But look at these beautiful cookies! Red and white dough. This is a strawberry cheesecake dough. You can have rainbow pride hamantaschen, because, of course, this is a holiday of coming out. Esther had to come out as a Jew, and this holiday has become a coming out holiday for LGBTQ people as well. So why not pride hamantaschen? And who doesn't like a sprinkle or two on their cookie, on their ice cream? Why not on hamantaschen as well? And of course, the delicious chocolate marble hamantaschen. Delicioso, as we would say. Now, this is always a challenge because for those of you who are vegan or gluten-free, guess what? Hamantaschen can also meet your dietary needs. There are gluten-free hamantaschen, there are vegan hamantaschen, any of them can work for you depending upon your dietary needs. Now, I know Groovy Rabbi Levy made fun of the fact that this is named for the villain. But how great is that you get to eat the villain? That is genius! You destroy him by shaking a graga. You destroy him and blot out his name? Well, we're going to really blot you out because now we're going to eat you and then we're going to poop on you. Poop it right out of you. That is wisdom, my friend. Of course... 
Hamantaschen, I think, are really better than latkes. Because if you go into any deli or any Jewish bakery, guess what you're going to see there? You're going to see Hamantaschen, not just on Purim, but all year long. And they are adaptable. Listen, Hamantaschen aren't greasy or oily. They can be parva. You don't have to decide whether you're having it be milchich or fleshik. They don't stink up the house for days and days on end. Listen, if you've ever made a latka and your house and you made a batch, you know that oil just lingers in the air for days on end. And by Thursday of the next week, you're done with it. You're so nauseous from the smell of old oil in the air. But latkas... The wafting smell of baking cookies. Look, the even realtors know that if you want somebody to buy a house, you bake some cookies because it smells so good. So, of course, hamantaschen in your house, baked, it's gonna, the aroma is going to linger and linger. And finally, hamantaschen don't go limp. You can easily pack them in your lunch and you can take them with you. If you make a good hamantaschen, it'll, it'll last and last. My friends, for all these reasons and so many more, in, I could go on for hours about why the hamantaschen is a triangle. I'll just refer you briefly to a marvelous article in the magazine Hey Alma, H-E-Y-A-L-M-A, -A, all about the triangular cakes that uh, used to be associated with the goddess Inanna, who has become associated with Ishtar, who, and of course, the story of Esther may, some scholars think, might be related to the goddess Eshtar and her consort Marduk, i.e. Mordechai. But I'll leave that for another different lesson. But I really urge you to read that article about why the shape of the Hamantaschen is so important. There's too many options, great many options for the filling, and simply Hamantaschen are truly the best. Well, now you have it. The reasons that you will think about between the latka and the hamantaschen and which are really best. We are going to definitely um, think about um, these things and I want you to think about it and in a few minutes we're going to put up a poll for you to take to vote on your favorite 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 food but in the meantime we're going to um, share just a little bit more the final verses of the Megillah so that you will have fulfilled some of your mitzvah and I think Rabbi Levy's got a few slides for us as well so starting in chapter 7 <clears throat> <laughs> so the king and Haman came to feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, the king asked Esther at the wine feast, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Queen Esther replied, If your majesty will do me the favor and it pleases your majesty, let my life be granted me as my wish and my people as my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, massacred, and exterminated. Had we only been sold as bondmen and bondwomen, I would have kept silent. The adversary is not worthy of a king's trouble. Thereupon King Ahasuerus demanded of Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who dared to do this? The adversary and the enemy replied, Esther is this evil Haman! And Haman cringed in terror before the king and the queen. The king in his fury left the wine feast for the palace garden, while Haman remained to plead with the king for his life, for he saw the king had resolved to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet room, Haman was lying prostrate on the couch on which Esther reclined. Does he mean, cried the king, to ravish the queen in my own palace? No sooner did these words leave the king's lips than Haman's face was blanched. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, says, What is more, a stake is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, the man whose words saved the king. Impale him on it. 
king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the stake which he had put up for Mordecai, and the king's fury abated. That very day, King Ahasuerus gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther, and Mordecai presented himself to the king, for Esther had revealed how he was related to her. King slipped off his ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther put Mordecai in charge of Haman's property. Esther spoke to the king again, at falling at his feet, weeping and beseeching him to avert the evil plotted by Haman the Agagite against the Jews. Once again, the king extended his golden scepter to Esther, and Esther arose and stood before the king. If it please your majesty, and I have won favor, and the proposal seems right to your majesty, and if I am pleasing to you, let dispatches be written, countermandering those which were written by Haman, son of Hamadatha, embodying his plot to annihilate the Jews throughout the king's provinces. For how can I see, bear to see disaster which will fall upon my people, and how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? So letters were dispatched by mounted courier riding steeds used in the king's service, bred of the royal stud. The king had permitted the Jews of every city to fight for their lives. If any people or province attacked him, they could destroy, massacre, and exterminate its armed force together. On a single day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, the text of the document was to be issued as a law for every single province. Mordecai left the king's presence in royal robes of blue and white, with a magnificent crown of gold and a mantle of fine linen and purple wool, and the city of Shushan rang with joyous cries. La Yehudim Haita Ora Vasimcha Vasason Vaikar. The Jews enjoyed light and gladness, happiness and honor, and in every province and every city when the king's command and decree arrived, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And so on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, when the king's command and decree was to be executed, on the very day which the enemy of the Jews had expected them to get them in their power, the opposite happened, and Jews got their enemies in their power. Throughout the province of the king Ahasuerus, the Jews mustered to attack those who sought their hurt, and no one could withstand them, for the fear of them had fallen upon all the people. Indeed, all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, governors, and the king's stewards, showed deference to the Jews because they feared Mordecai. For Mordecai was now powerful in the royal palace, and his fame was spreading throughout all of the province. The man Mordecai was growing ever more powerful. So the Jews struck at their enemies with their sword, slaying them, and wrecked their will upon their enemies. In the fortress Shushan, the Jews killed a total of 500. And they also killed Parshandata, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridata, Parmashata, Arisai, Aridai, and Vazatha, the ten sons of Haman, sons of Hamadatha, the foes of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the spoils. These days of Purim shall be observed at their proper time, as Mordecai the Jew and now Queen Esther has obligated them to do, just as they have assumed for themselves and their descendants the obligations of fasts with their lamentations, and Esther's ordinance validating these observances of Purim was recorded on the scroll. King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the mainland of the islands, all his mighty and powerful acts, and a full account of the greatness to which the king advanced Mordecai are recorded in the annals of the king of Medea and Persia. For Mordecai the Jew ranked next to King Ahasuerus and was highly regarded by the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brethren, he sought the good of his people and interceded for the welfare of his kindred. And just like we say, that's all, folks. So now, having heard the Megillah, and having heard the reasons why the Hamantaschen is actually better than the Latkes, Rabbi Groovy Rabbi Levy will now help us institute the polling. So get ready to vote, friends. The poll is live. I feel like I need to be wearing khakis and have an interactive screen behind me to, to monitor the, the votes. 
Let's make sure everybody should vote. We want everybody's vote to count. Don't even have to wait in line. Don't have to mail a ballot. <laughs> Don't even have to register. Okay, a couple more seconds. Has everybody voted? Okay. Groovy Rabbi Levy, do the ready? honors. We don't have an envelope to say, and the envelope, please. And the winner is? You put up a good fight, Rabbi. Well, well, Groovy Rabbi, we'll just have to come back next year, and we'll see who who wins. So we'll send you back to the bullpen. You get, send get, me back get to the bullpen. I've been called out. Make a call to the bullpen. Replace me. Um, I will say that I, I didn't tell you this, but I will tell you. I will tell you that. In the 75 plus years of the Kamatosh and Latka debate, the Latkas won more than three quarters of the time. So, congratulations to the Team Latka. Us Kamatoshan folks will have to try again next year. Um, friends, this has been so much fun. Thanks for celebrating Purim. Nancy, thank you as always for helping us preserve the melody and to keep that alive. Uh, thank you to Rabbi Levy for a, a lot of coordination behind the scenes tonight. And to all of you, a uh, reminder that tomorrow at noon is Lunch and Learn online on Zoom. So no matter where you are in the world, you can join us and it will be a special Purim Lunch and Learn, a little learning together on Purim. And then Friday night is Shabbat Services at 6.30, both uh, streaming on Facebook and YouTube and in person. And then Saturday night uh, at, what time did we call it? Six o'clock is dinner, but it's sold, dinner sold out. So if you didn't sign up for dinner, sorry, you're out of luck. We completely sold out for dinner. But uh, the show, the Havdalah will be around 7, and the show will start at 7.15. So I hope you can come down and join us to our, in person. I'll remind you that it was two years ago that that Purim was our last big event at Kolami. How nice to try and be back together. We will read Megillah, uh, some of the Megillah excerpts, and uh, you don't want to miss a great celebration. So again, um, Happy Purim. Hug Sameach, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. And we look forward, hopefully, tomorrow at Lunch and Learn, uh, Friday night at Services, Saturday at Torah Study at 10 a.m. online. Yeah, we're doing Torah Study on Saturday. Busy week. It's a busy weekend. So happy Purim, everybody. Hug Sameach. Hug Sameach. Good yeah.